So to start us off, I this is a book that really looks at the world through what you call a feminist gaze. And I was wondering if you could describe what that gaze is and um, and what what we can see through it. Is it better? Yes. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm very, very proud to be talking to you tonight. Thank you for this introduction. Um, well, a feminist gaze, I, I think feminism is actually a gaze, <clears throat> the way I understand it and the way I I behave and, and work as a feminist is to offer a distinct way, a different point of view on the world, um, on the society, on every single aspect of our lives. Um, and the feminist gaze would be like a very complex and queer and multiple gaze uh, as an opposition to some neutral fantasized uh, gaze that patriarchy has tried to make us believe existed. Um, a, a feminist gaze is a feminist that a feminist um, is a gaze that goes against the idea of objectivity. Uh, every point of view, every time you see or analyze something or learn something, you learn it from where you stand. You learn it from your own experience, uh, from your gender, your race, your class, your origins. So I think a feminist gaze is just a, a, uh, uh, an invitation to look at the world with, a more, with more complexity and more subjectivity. Um, and I, I really love it, the description that you write in this book. So I'm going to ask Lauren to read it in French, and then I'll read a quick translation of what this gaze is all about. Thank you. Un féministe gaze n'est même plus un regard, c'est un enlacement. Le patriarcat scrute le monde comme un réalisateur misogyne filme une actrice, caméra braquée comme un fusil, découpant les fesses les seins, les yeux, par morceaux, à la louche. Un regard féministe sur le monde, c'est caresser des yeux chaque grain d'un épiderme, capter les liaisons et les circulations, englober la planète d'un souffle. Et ce simple regard a la faculté colossale de résoudre la plupart des grands mots de l'humanité. And so just for the translation for those of, of us among, those of you among us who don't speak, French, um, the feminist gaze is not a look, it's an embrace. Patriarchy scans the world like a misogynistic director films an actress, an actress, camera pointed like a gun, cutting out the butt, the breasts, the eyes, cutting them by pieces, by the spoonful. The feminist gaze looks at, um, at the world is to caress with the eyes, every inch of skin, to capture the connections and the circulations, to encompass the planet with a breath. And this simple gaze has the colossal faculty or possibility to solve most of the great problems of humanity. So thank you for this translation. <laughs> um, one, one way that your gaze looks at the world that I think is very different from many other feminists is that yours is a very universal feminism and one that encompasses many, many people, not just people who identify as women, I wonder how you define who can be a feminist and how you um, and and what kinds of conversations such a universal view can bring. I think it's so interesting and so yeah, I love the way you you the way you use the adjective universal to describe my feminist uh, work because it is universal. But I guess in France, uh, this approach would be called intersectional and would be like opposed to universal, which is like a lie and and propaganda. <laughs> um, when you start thinking about uh, discrimination, uh, gender discrimination, it's impossible to not start looking at other discrimination. Uh, if you think that there is a bunch of a group of people in the world called women who have a very uh, similar uh, um, oppressions and similar life, you 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 lose a big part of it. You 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 cannot speak about racism if you speak about only women. You ha you have to 
uh, it's Kimberly Crenshaw who, who came up with this idea of intersectionality that you had to look to the way uh, discrimination interlace and create different you know destinies for different women especially uh, she she reminded the importance of using you know racism uh, as a as a prism to understand the lives of um, especially black women in in the case of the story of the paper she was writing at that time in the 80s uh, and little by little um, intersectionality also like meant you know uh, talking about um, disability our sexual orientation and of course class so the more i use this tool because i see it as a tool it's not a it's not a movement it's not an ideology it's just a sociological tool that really works that gives like quite precise information on the way people live uh, little by little um, it made me feel like women was not a relevant category to describe the world properly and fundamentally to me the the goal of feminism uh, is to reach equality and justice it's a very simple goal and if you if the aim of the of the story is to reach equality and justice you have to 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 englobe everybody uh, and and i think uh, not all the feminists think the same way as i do but i think men can be feminist uh, i i actually wish more men uh, would be feminists because as long as you just you know embrace this this gaze and understand you know gender discrimination and the way other discrimination like you know interact with gender discrimination you're if you think this is unfair <laughs> and you want to fight against them well you're a feminist so yeah I, I don't I don't see it as um as a woman thing especially uh because today especially in Europe um fascism and far right is embodied by women and this is like something we should really think about and and it's one of the strategies of far right to use women uh, you know like women who are like nicely dressed and who are like usually moms and who, who speak softly and and you know try and make forget people that their aim is fascism and so we should really be careful to not mix women and feminism because it's not doesn't mean the same thing at all complex technology yes and i think i mean i think one of the parts of this book that is so powerful is the way that you bring in you know that feminism is a way of looking at the world it can even be a set of practices but it doesn't necessarily mean a set of people who are delineated by the way they look or certain aspects of the way that they um that they are i i wanted to to touch on something that you said which is justice because um, much of this book talks about justice, especially justice in the wake of sexual violence, and it's published at a particular moment, um, five years after Me Too, um, when the media often portrays all of feminism as coming from Me Too uh, or, or a result of Me Too, which anyone who has followed Lorem's work or has read this book knows is absolutely not the case. In the book, you um, you posit a very interesting way of of thinking and um, and and working through uh, sexual violence, and that is through the prism of restorative justice, which is itself um, a very interesting way of thinking. And I wondered if you could tell us what that is and why it might be a different solution to thinking through sexual violence. Uh, yes, with pleasure. Um, restorative justice is uh, still very marginalized. Um, I've been talking about it in the media a little on the over the last few weeks. And by the way, people react on social media. I can tell you, it's very, very far, far away from being understood. And and I'm afraid um, most people are still like convinced that punishment and exclusion is the best answer to any type of violence. And you know it's hard to blame them for it because prison has been you know the, the everybody thinks prison is natural uh, in the introduction of uh, angela davis our prisons obsolete she says that that it's really really hard to take out from people's mind that we used to live in a world where there was no prison the prison were invented 200 years ago um, during the french revolution and then it was used in the colonies to control uh, the bodies of the colonized people so it was all mainly a tool of colonization and racism um, and it still is 
uh, that's the point of Angela Davis in this book. Uh, when you look at who is who are the people in the prison today, it's mainly like people who are not white, people who are poor. Uh, there is this figure that I'm still amazed at, like women in prison only represent 4% of the prisoners. Uh, I don't know if you would say this in English, prisoners, whatever. Um, and also, okay, women are only 4% of the prisoners, but among these women, 75% uh, are Rom, Rom women, you know, Rom. So it's crazy, I mean, like, <laughs> Um, the disproportion between the the the, po the population of um, women in French and the population in prison shows how much a racist tool is, it is. Um, so it's very interesting um, because sometimes people don't understand how this can be linked to feminism. Uh, first of all, it is linked to feminism because we have to think of racism and with feminism. That's what Angela Davis uh, shows us. And it's, it's interesting to see that uh, this... Uh, anti-carceral movement has been mainly embodied by Afro-feminist uh, or Black feminism in the US and also in France, actually. But also, <clears throat> um, there is this, as a feminist, you have to, to understand that prison or the penal right, le droit penal, the fact that uh, rape is being punished by the law, by a 15-year-old uh, uh, prison sentence, doesn't prevent rape from happening it just doesn't work and that's just obvious you don't need to have to to spend years thinking or making philosophy to find this out uh, in France we estimate there are about like 200,000 rapes a year uh, and in 2020 700 rapes were punished by the law so that means like 0.6% of rapes are punished by the law and 0.6% of rapists go to jail. Uh, why is that? Because first of all, many times a rapist is not a stranger that is going to jump on you with a knife on the street at night. Most of the time, the rapist is your father or your husband or your boss or your friend or someone you work with so when a woman is raped most of the time she doesn't want to go to the police because going there and you know um when you can complain against her rapist would destroy his life but also hers so there are many hesitation to go there also because most of the time in the police office um the women are very badly welcome you know the uh, police officer are like what were you wearing were you drunk did you do anything that made this you know you know this story so that's the reason why first of all many many rapes don't just don't go to justice and then when miraculously they get to justice and there is an inquiry that made uh, it's very rare that there are proofs and it ends up being like you know parole contre parole i don't know how you would say it in english but um he said, she said, oh, I just understood the title of the book. She said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> um, excellent book, by the way, which I read without understanding the title. Um, and so it's very hard for a woman to prove she has been raped. That's the reason why at the end of the day, uh, very, very little men go to jail. And, and rape keep on happening. So obviously men are not afraid to go to jail then and that's the point of jail you know it's supposed like to if you do this you will go to jail well they're not afraid it's just not working and even if we were like thinking we really want to put the rapist into jail what does this mean we should build like 1000 new jails um the situation of jails in france is absolutely crazy like uh, people sleep on mattresses among rats and spiders and i mean if you are like just a little worried about human rights you just can't want this to happen to thousand more people so you have to think of another way um, to judge of another way to repair um, and there are so many so many ways so many direction to think of new ways to repair and in France there is this um, well actually I say in France because she's French but she's studying in the US because these questions are really hard to push in France I think her name is Gwenola Ricardo and she's the one who really made me understand all this. And one of the sentences she said that really impacted me most, uh, she said that, you know, penal right, uh, I don't know if it's the right name, penal. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, it doesn't repair the victims. Like as a victim, you have a certain amount of needs 
and none of these needs are met by a trial. And, and that really impacted me a lot because, um, I don't know, uh, you won't feel safer knowing that a violent man is in prison is, is going to go out someday after having through uh, having gone through years of this violence. So we have to think a different way. And one of the ways is maybe to organize conversations between authors of violence and victims of, of violence. And, and I know it's really hard to hear when it's the first time you, you hear it. And I'm not saying like, hey, go give a hug to your rapist and it's going to be fine because it's not what I'm saying and it's not what restorative justice is. Um, but in France, there is starting to be like some, um, you know, some meetings organized between authors of violence and victims who have suffered the same violence, although it's not their victim. And it actually seems to be helping both it's helping the victim to understand better how such a gesture could have been made by the author of violence but it also helps the author of violence to feel like more human and to feel like it's possible like um to feel like you know empathy and maybe redemption and i think we have to look in this direction and i'm going to finish by saying uh, many countries have developed this much more than france like canada or new zealand and in both these countries, uh, the the pace to this restorative justice has been made possible um, because uh, les peuples autochtones, uh, Maori people in New Zealand, are um, I, I don't know how to say um, indigenous people. Thank you. In Canada, uh, had to remind the government that that's the way things used to work before colonization. So. I don't know. I think it's an infinite space to explore, and I and I I was really it was really important for me to make this accessible uh, to as many people as possible in this book, uh, and hoping that I don't know it would spread a bit. <laughs> uh, yes, and you're making it accessible to us too in two different languages, which is of course really <laughs> it's a bit hard. Uh, I have to admit, <laughs> amazing for for our audience. Um, who are here and and watching, um, and I I was fascinated in reading the book. I'm just going to keep dropping little morsels so you'll all buy it. That actually there is um, a system in place in France to do restorative justice that was put in place by Christiane Taubira, but it's actually only happened 43 times since 2019. Um, so that's something to think about, I'm sure. Um, another big area of of your of your book focuses on care work and I, which is of course such an important aspect, not only of feminism, but our society. We're coming out of a pandemic in which many of the people on the front lines uh, were women, continue to be women, women who are underpaid, whose work is not valorized. Um, and care is a, a large part of this book about the feminist gaze and a large part of what that gaze means to you. I was struck reading the book that care is one of the words that is not translated into French and remains just care in, italics, in italics uh, throughout, um, which made me all the more curious to ask you, what is care and what is its place within feminism? Uh, the fact that it's not translated has actually been a very conscious decision from uh, the, the researchers who wrote uh, care theory uh, in France. Uh, Patricia Paperman, uh, Sandra Logier, uh, Pascal Molinier, uh, and they decided that care, care in English would be translated by soin in French, but by the idea of soin, you don't get the idea of solicitude. You don't get the idea of I care about you, you matter to me. So in the end, they kept the English word. Um, and well, it's very interesting to remember that the very beginning of care theory was uh, found in psychology. Uh, Carol Gilligan, uh, the first uh, feminist, fem feminist thinker who, who came up with this theory was a, a psychologist. And it's really important to remind this because sometimes care can be misunderstood 
as you know an essentialist vision saying that women are naturally more caring are we naturally sweeter are we care more are we like more built to take care of others that's exactly what feminism is not we're we're fighting this i hope we all agree on this uh, but what carol gilligan says is that the way we educate little girls and the way we raise uh, kids we're gonna teach girls to uh, to to have uh, empathy to feel compassion to take care of others to wonder like to ask people how are you and we're going to teach little boys to be strong and and brave and to not worry about people around them and worry about their own comfort and she's going to she, she decides there is two different type of justice, the justice of care, which is a complex justice, like before taking a decision, you're going to make sure like all the interactions in the room are taken care of and what consequences it might have, what other solutions we might have. And then there is the uh, l'éthique de la justice. I don't know how it, it's, sorry. Oh, thank you. L'éthique uh, justice is just like good or bad are uh, right or wrong and and what she says the the most interesting part of it is that society has made this uh litigious justice of right and wrong like superior because it's more efficient it's faster it's like better and and the complexity of what's going on in the girl's brain uh, the ethic of care is like it doesn't worse more because it's too complex it takes too long and she's not mature and so it it really describes very well what sexism is um, and how these jobs that are the the travail du care and it was fascinating during the covid period i was like it's crazy because people are going to understand finally that it's ridiculous to pay these people that are the only vital vital people in our society to pay them so badly but nothing changed um, because <clears throat> these functions of care uh, there are 10 they tend to be naturalized like you know, uh, mother take care of their child because it's biological and they need to take care of their child. And and we're going to invent some stories about like, you know, some people would like to clean houses or would like to take care of kids, which is not true at all. Uh, it's economy, it's capitalism. And it's also a place where intersectional um, vision is very important because these jobs are are many times women take care of these jobs but also women from the south hemisphere and women who also suffer racism um so it, it this this tool of care is another incredible tool to look at the world and and through this tool you don't only see women's life but also the lives of children, the life of elderly. You can talk about the hospital, about the health system. And, and it's, it's also um, a very, very political uh, tool. And sometimes I wonder why it's not used by the governments to take decisions because it would be so powerful and it would help uh, so much to build, you know, fairer uh, policies. Uh, that's a very good question, and one that I hope politicians will will think about after reading your book. Yeah, because they're all going to read it, for well, sure. <laughs> they're all zooming in right now. Um, I wanted to to ask you a little bit about how you read and how you find ideas, because one of the things that's so impressive about this book is that not only are there such fascinating discussions of topics like care, but you bring in so many thinkers, so many scholars, so many um, people of from his, you know, women who have fought these battles in different ways in different time periods throughout history. Um, people like Vandana Shiva and Françoise Dobon, who are both uh, large parts of your chapter on ecofeminism, which some of you may want to ask a question about later. Um, or or feminist thinkers, not only de Beauvoir, but Monique Mitting and all of these people. And I just wonder how do you find how do you find these figures of inspiration and um and of information when you're researching questions? Um I read all the time. I just do I I never I never watch a movie. <laughs> I haven't watched a series for six years. I'm just not never interested enough. Like I always like find feminist book more interesting than any other type of interest. I'm like a geek of feminism. 
Um, and and also there is this very um, there is this characteristic in feminist book of you know um, mentioning quoting all the time, because as a feminist I know very well that uh, women's writings, women's work are always like erased through times. That's the particularity of what we do. It, uh, people forget it, erase it, and thank God there are libraries who keep safe our archives because it's so important because we get erased. So as a feminist. I always like, I think it's so important for me to always give the name of the woman who thought of this thing before me and 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 mention and give like tons of references of books at the end of my book. But I do it because I've seen it done in so many other books. And usually when you read a book, a feminist book, you end up with like 10 more books to read. <laughs> so I started doing this like I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and I haven't stopped yet because I always have new books, uh, new thinkers, new names that come that came up, and and always I'm also very uh, I love history, and every time I find out about an author, I love to read her life and to understand what type of you know of uh, obstacles she's gone through in her in her time, and yeah, it's it makes me understand that. I'm in the continu in the continuity of women. It's not about waves. Um, there is this um, uh, philosopher and historian called Geneviève Fraisse, a uh, French historian. I really love her. She's a philosopher of history. She hates when people say she's an historian. Uh, and she always says there is no waves. She hates it when you say first wave, second wave, third wave of feminism. Like it was always feminism. Just sometimes we forgot about feminists and we erased them. But we've always been fighting for our rights. And there is a continuity. And I love to believe that I'm, a, you know, a great granddaughter of uh, Olympe de Gouges. <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, that's one of the things that as someone who grew up in the United States, I found so fascinating about France. And we were talking about this a little bit as we were um preparing and you know just getting to know each other is just how little stock French culture seems to take of its own feminist legacy that so much of feminism from someone like Olympe de Gouges um all through uh, any number of women came from France and yet often when you hear feminism talked about uh for example and I turn on the ra radio you would think that there were uh, militant American feminists you know giving out pamphlets on the street to uh, French people who had never even thought about feminism, which is obviously so incredibly wrong. Why do you think that this aspect of, of France's intellectual legacy is so often pushed out? Um, because French theorists, uh, uh, especially... Um, materialists or our left-wing theorists have been pushed out of France and and you know Monique Wittig or uh, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, they they literally like went to the US to work properly and and they were like you know um, treated better in, in American universities uh, than in French. Like Monique Wittig, she she left. Uh, she was one of the founders of the MLF, which is like the main uh, feminist movement in the 70s in France. And and she got into this huge fight with uh, the other half of MLF, who were people who were more like essentialist. And and she left. And, and yeah, her, her main uh, articles and her most strong text that have been written from the US. Um, and actually, all this uh, gave birth to French theory, uh, which then, you know, gave birth to, I guess, Judith Butler. Um, so I think one of the reasons is this, that many thinkers were not understood in France and had to go away. Uh, and also this idea of, um, you know, French feminists being uh, influenced by American, it's a strategy of a uh, of conservatism uh, that has been going on for the last 40 years, like every time, um, you know, this um, uh, harassment, uh, the idea of uh, harassment at work, sexual harassment, it came from the U.S. Because us in France, you know, we love uh, seduction and uh, we're the country of, you know, a sex and sex and romanticism and we're not like the U.S. who are like so prude and and, and that's a very caricatural way, caricatural way, of course, um, to to talk about uh, feminism. But I think it's 
I think is changing a little by little, also by 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 the work of many feminists who are, you know, digging in the books and in the texts and finding out all this incredible heritage we have uh, in French feminism. Yes, and certainly through your work, which has introduced, you know, uh, I think a, a younger generation uh, to so many important um, thinkers and which has created such a valuable archive of, of feminist thought from so many different corners. Um, so I, I think we are all very grateful for that. Thank you. I wonder, um, you know, but I just have a few more questions before we open it up to the audience, but what role do men play in all of this? You mentioned in your book that men, uh, you know, can be, should be included in, in feminism. I have to say that I noticed that not many men are here, but I'm hopeful that they're all at home taking care of the children. Um, you know, how, how how can feminism include men in a way that um, that still manages to advance feminist causes? Uh, I, I, it's always hard for me to to answer to questions starting by how because. <laughs> Because I think I have a I have a vision of what would be okay, but how to go there is still sometimes a mystery to me. But uh, I turn it out uh, as more you know I have a, a bigger level of um, exigence. How would I say this? Um, yeah, of demand towards men because I have the feeling like on the, over the last five years, some men have been like, "Hey, I'm with you. I hate rape," and yeah. Go ahead, but no, I I, I expect more for, from them. Uh, I want them to be, you know, protesting with us. Uh, I want them to come with me in front of the Polish embassy when I'm fighting for the right to abortion for my Polish sisters. Uh, I want them, you know, to post uh, things on their social media and get, you know, cyber arrest like I have been cyber arrest for the last few years. Uh, I mean, I want, I want, I would like them to to be more concretely in the fight and also to understand that it's also about them because femininity is built and imposed to us but masculinity too and actually at the end of the day i know very little men who are totally comfortable in masculinity and all the you know things we expect uh, them to be so and also like when you think about abortion or contraception they're totally uh you know it's also their story that it's really important for them to have abortion and and reproductive rights so i would like them to be more more implied um physically in the fight but lately i've been promoting my book around and and talking about a journalist and and many men journalists actually my book seems to attract men journalists more than than the previous one and and i see it like they're panicking because they're like yeah but when i say i'm a feminist like feminists yell at me because i cannot be here because i'm going to take too much space and i think it's uncomfortable for them i think it's hard they're probably it's going to be a transition and i'm and i'm like yeah it's uncomfortable welcome to my life you know yeah it's going to be really hard for you to find the right spot but try harder it's going to be fine you can be uncomfortable for maybe a few months and maybe you'll find your spot um so I really expect it to change. And I kind of feel, although, of course, my point of view is the one of a feminist woman in Paris in very privileged um, areas, that the younger generation uh, boys are not afraid to call them th themselves feminists. And I kind of hope that it's going to be easier for the next generation. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in just one minute. Um, but before that, I wanted you to read just a tiny bit from the end of the book, because as I mentioned, this is uh, a very hopeful book, and I can already feel the hope level rising in the room a little bit, you know, as we Great. <laughs> as we talk. Um, so if you can just read uh, from the epilogue of the book. Il va nous falloir apprendre à réparer plutôt qu'à punir, à travailler à nos apaisements plutôt que d'attendre qu'une illusoire tierce ce pouvoir ne vienne trancher de haut nos différents. Et nous montrerons l'exemple à l'humanité, car l'humanité entière a besoin de réparation.
And just a translation, we will need to le learn how to repair rather than punish, to work on appeasement rather than waiting for an imaginary third power to come and settle our differences from above. And we will set an example to humanity because all of humanity needs to be repaired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, fantastic. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, I see one at the back. You had mentioned restorative justice, which I I have several friends in the States that, that do that work. Um, so far, my knowledge of it has been in intimate settings, like you said, where you know most rapists are family members, friends, unfortunately. However, um, so my background is military, and I have seen um, and experienced rape as a systematic um, crime to suppress whistleblowers, to suppress, uh, not, not just men and women, uh, not just women, but also men. Um, and so when it's in that kind of criminal context of systematic gang rape, systematic rape to shut somebody up, to intimidate somebody, um, rape to uh, initiate, rape to haze, uh, rape to um, basically create, form ranks. Um, it becomes very, I, and I haven't heard anybody talk about how from a feminist point of view um, to, to address that in a way that is reconstructive, um, especially when it is in a place that is so systematic, like a military setting or a corporate setting or um, an NGO setting, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas or in your readings, you have any thoughts to that, that type of rape as crime. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us. Um, I tend to think uh, that actually most rapes are systemic. Um, you know, when you, uh, a few years ago, uh, Me Too incest uh, emerged in France and I realized the amount of people who had been raped inside their family. This is a system. And there is a a common point with what you just described it's boys and girls um you know rape is used of course in war and we've seen like what's going on in ukraine right now like women are raped but also men uh, and there is sexual uh, abuse on on soldiers on ukrainian soldiers by the russian army um and I kind of, yeah, even when you look at the, what's going on in the movie industry, or I think most rape is systemic. And I think the reparative justice might, in the end, also be a good answer to specifically this systemic point of view on things, because um, I develop on this on the book, um, because in there is this idea in restorative justice that it's not an individual that has gone nuts or is like mean. Uh, it's an individual who is part of a system. And, and when you start talking about restorative and, and repair, you talk about all the people around, all the complicities, all the people who helped, who closed their eyes, who just shut up, who didn't help, who didn't realize that was okay, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and to me, it's when I say, there is a part in the book where I say to me, me too is a, a failure um, because I think we failed to understand that rape was systemic and that rape is not a war of some men against some women. Uh, rape is a tool of domination, of silenciation. And I, if you want me to give you some interesting reference on this, although it might be a bit, seem to you a bit far away from what you just described, but I'm sure it will help you. It's Dorothée Ducy. Uh, Dorothée Ducy, uh, she's one of the main researchers on incest. And she wrote this uh, book called Le Berceau des Dominations. Um, when you read this book, it changed just your life forever. And, and she's the one who made me understand that rape was a tool of uh, exactly what she said. That, that's what, you know, it, it impacted me a lot, what she just said about, you know, intimidating, silencing. And, and by rape, we learn to kids 
to just like you know shut up and and be obedient and yeah and fit in this society of violence and you know so Dorothée Ducy I I'm sure you'll find some answers there thank you questions do you have one no no Um, I have too many, but um, you said a little bit about your interviews, and uh, that that was really interesting because I was wondering if you were getting some, you know, attention that, from the media. But I guess you are, so good. Um, you mentioned two words that struck me as a little ironic. You mentioned that men should be a little braver about. Uh, their participation, and you also mentioned that they should be a little more protective, right? Uh, when we go to court or the like, okay? So, you know, it seems those are a little bit stereotypical. Yeah, I, I would never say that you use the word protective. Maybe I used it because of my poor English vocabulary. <laughs> But no, I, I I just wish they would get as much uh, hit in their face that I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a lot and I'm tired and I, you know, I would like them to, yeah, to get to, to go on a TV show and say like, oh, men rape and see what happened, you know, I would also like them to give me a massage and take care of my kids and walk my dog and make me a coffee, you know, because I'm really tired. And it's very tired to be very tiring to be a feminist. So I don't know more concrete, I guess. Like, you know, it's just words. It's just like retweets or like thumbs up, you know. I, I need more. I need their bodies and their voices to be in the room but not all feminists agree with me and and actually what happens often is that when a man starts like uh, for example uh, yeah i'm sorry i have to mention him but Yvon Jablonka uh, is a is a french uh, i don't know what he is a, story, a historian i think historian yes he wrote this book uh, that is a feminist book and it kind of he actually understood uh, quite well what's going on with uh, gender but he forgot to quote many feminists in this book and because he studied in normal which is like the most powerful school and he gets invited on all the tv shows and he gets all the credit for her, and it's annoying <laughs> as a feminist so I, I i had a debate with him you, you, it's online on youtube you, you can look at it uh, it might interest you and i'm you know, I have mixed feelings about him. I'm like, I guess, thank you, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and it's, I, yeah, I, I think it's, I understand it, it may be, it might be hard for men to find their, their place. But it's also interesting to see that there is hardly no men in this room. And if we had uh, presented this evening as a non, uh, a, a non mixity event, like only for women, they would probably be like men demonstrating in front of the door to get in. That's the interesting part. Hmm. Lohan, we have a really lovely question on Zoom from Clara, who asks, is there an area in society where you see a feminist gaze already prevailing and working? Oh. And Clara's actually in that box. So oh. when you answer... Hi, just... Clara. <laughs> uh, thank you for this question. Um, well. I don't know. It's it's a hard question, but I can't. I kind of tend to feel like um, ecology uh, is is a feminist gaze on the world, like starting to stop looking at the earth as a never ending uh, source of energy and material and industry and capitalism and like start you know offering a um, the possibility like to slow things down and to see things differently and to look at the way you know uh, the old vivant <laughs> uh, 
uh, everything that is alive on earth uh, can you know interacts and depends from one another and you know realizing that the fish in the ocean is probably as important as a human uh, in paris uh, i think it's kind of a feminist way to look at the world uh, it's you know, we didn't have the time to talk about ecofeminism but the more i think of it i i don't even understand uh, why we came up with this word ecofeminism because to me feminism is uh, ecology and ecology is feminist so i guess it's probably the place where yeah we have we have a different gaze on the on the world and on the planet and uh we know that among uh, ecologist activists there is a huge uh, there is much many more women than men which is probably uh, cultural and not you know biological but still many more women thank you yes yes go to the back and then to the front Hello, um, I was just wondering some of your thoughts on um, women's bodies in the medical field and how we're so far behind in research on women's bodies and understanding them and how in psychology, for example, like women with ADHD are diagnosed so much later in life than men and how everything like diagnosis based is based off of men's bodies and their symptoms in comparison to women. And if there's anything we can do to kind of help that cause, because obviously we're in a time where there's more women doctors than ever before, but it still feels like we're so just stuck in the research when it comes to our actual bodies. Yeah, thank you. Well, you actually reminded things so clearly. I don't have much to, to add to this, but I always have the feeling, um, it's again a how question. Uh, and how uh, I tend to think money uh, because research is expensive and it took uh, research years and years and millions of dollars to came up with a little blue pill that would help men, uh, you know, go hard when they're old. And I'm glad it's possible. I'm really happy for them. But I mean, like there is no money put on endometriosis, uh, which is a terrible disease. Uh, which actually uh, takes usually like nine to 10 years for women to get diagnosed with. Uh, it, it causes terrible pain and fertility. And there is no cure. Why? Because there is no research. Why? Because there is no money. So sometimes I just wish like as much effort uh, would be put in, you know, research on men, women's health uh, than on men's um yeah I, can, I don't know if I really answer it's not my my field of specialty but it's very true and it's very linked to everything we've been uh, saying tonight thank you uh, th thank you for your talk uh you, just going uh, along with some of the the questions afterwards you said that this man who was a feminist never quoted people and you're very careful to always give your sources. And I'm just thinking there's a source that you seem to ignore, uh, religion. If we go back to the Bible, first chapter, Genesis, you've got two trees. One tree is good and bad. That's your judgmental. The other tree, which nobody ever talks about, is the sympathy tree. Now, you're not even mentioning this. Now, I didn't know. Well, that's because Christians <laughs> dropped it because it's easier to control people with good and bad. But if you go to other religions, take the Dalai Lama. He always starts out with nobody would have even lived to be born if your mother hadn't cared to bring that pregnancy to term. We are all here only because of the empathy and care. And that's the smallest species, you know, it, it's not a people thing. So he, if you look at all of that, he has gone over and over this. The whole Buddhist uh, canon is based on that. Now, we have many religions, Native American, Mother Earth. You said, why are women ecologists? Well, hello, it's because Mother Earth, the uh, Earth is worshipped as mother. You talked about economics. Home economics is before 
economics we have today. I'm old. I studied home economics. What is home economics? It's balancing the budget in the home, saving resources, recycling. So, you know, all of that kind of women's work, that was ecology, which has now been taken away. People forget. And now they talk about ecology and economics. Nobody talks about home economics. Yeah, it's so yeah, actually in the book, there is a part about my my mom's uh, education and how, yeah, when she was a little girl, she was taught how to, you know, home economics, arménager, I guess, more or less. Yeah. But of, of course, there are many other parts. I mean, empathy is very universal and it's, yeah, it's everywhere, but it's been uh, silence and it's not valued in the society in which we lived, which is terrible. But thank you so much for reminding me. And I'm going to look about this tree of sympathy. Fascinated. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's the goddess? I have it. I have it. But it's always a bit also tricky. Um, I don't know. I don't want to go... Uh, Lord, yeah. have, we have we a have great we have a, we have a great question. Um, we were talking before this conversation about your interest in education, and so Kaylee asks, "What actions do you see changing the landscape in education, moving state education towards a feminist lens, especially in primary school? Patriarchy is, after all, epistemological." I I, I didn't get it. Can you repeat the <laughs> yes, question, yes. please? What actions do you see changing the landscape in education and moving state education towards a feminist lens, especially in primary school? Patriarchy is, after all, epistemological. Yes, uh, education is uh, central. What actions I see? It's another how question. <laughs> um, well, but it's it's funny because, for example, uh, there is a law in France that uh, you know it was uh, it was voted uh, I think six or ten years ago uh, that in uh, college, but college is not college, uh, middle school, um, people are supposed to receive uh, twice a year a sexual education class. So at the end of college, normally like people who have received like more or less like. 12 hours of sexual education, which would be like a good occasion to talk about, you know, consentment and, you know, that type of things uh, and, uh, and avoid rape. I mean, it would be crazy. And recently, uh, a feminist association, Nutut, uh, made a big inquiry in France and realized that out of this 12 hours that were guaranteed by the law, uh, only two hours were given to the students. So of course they they finish class with they have never heard a, of a consentment, they have never heard of a clitoris, and so many you know other information that might be useful for their sexual life. Um, so I mean, just implementing the law would be amazing. It, it, it's it's crazy because uh, most of the time you you realize that the laws are all good; they're just just not applied anywhere. So of course, sexual education would. I think help a lot. Mm. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question in the room. Possibly from someone we haven't someone heard here. from. Yes. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I apologize because I think my question is a how question too. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I can maybe uh, transform it into a what do you do when? <laughs> Uh, I know that um, this book is hopeful, but you also mentioned that you sometimes got tired of being a feminist and fighting. So my question is, what do you do when that happens? And how do you defeat um, despair in that specific area? Um, well, actually, we were talking about this earlier, right before the, you know, my everybody's like, your book is full of hope and optimism, but I wrote it because I was so pessimistic and, and des desperate. Um, I really, I, I'm really scared of the way the world is going. I really feel like we're gonna crush into the wall of global warming and fascism like, like in two minutes. 
sorry <laughs> sorry to end the evening like this <laughs> we had you know lift hoped and everything so but 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 my way of fighting this despair was writing this book and and you know realizing that there were already many places where things had changed and many people fighting and many ideas um written by feminists and and that it was possible to to promote uh, nonviolence and empathy and reparation, and I could do my part. Um, and more concretely, uh, I I learned uh, throughout the years to not pay as much attention as I used to to anti-feminism, which is a very strong and powerful uh, organization. It's terrible. Like as soon as you you know, share feminist ideas in this public space, you get death threats every day and rape threats. And I'm a white educated woman. Uh, I mean, for my friends who are black Afro-feminists or people from like, you know, poorer backgrounds than me, it's even worse. Uh, and it used to destroy me. It used to be, you know, really hard for me to recover from this, um, from these episodes of harassment, especially online. And throughout the years, I really learned to understand that these people were not talking about me. They were not fighting me. They were fighting my ideas. They were fighting, you know, the society I'm trying to promote. And But the people who support me, the people who read my book, the people who write me an email to, to thank me for a podcast, or, they're really seeing me and they're really talking to me. And so I really learned little by little to pay more attention to these people. And, and it's really helping because we are there are many of us, many, many of us. And I think there are more and more. So instead of focusing on the one, you know, uh, horrible man who's telling me I'm dumb, because basically I'm dumb for them, uh, I'm going to focus to the 10 or 100 uh, women who read my book and, and understand it.